Hi, Marco. Hello, Jeffrey. Hello, Ed. Can you hear us, Ed? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Then I actually got my controls to work right. And how are you? How are you all doing? I'm good. I'm still on vacation, so. Vacation? Hmm. I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on a permanent vacation, aren't you? Well, that's what people like to think. But I can tell you that once you retire, you yearn for vacation. <laughs> because every Everybody thinks they know what's best for you to do with your time. <laughs> At least you have an excuse when you're working and you have schedules and appointments and all those kinds of important things. You can you can rush around and you know you're 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 being grasped by something. But when that all goes away, <laughs> you're just uh, what the Germans call Freiwild. You're just game that's been. <laughs> set free to be taken out. <laughs> so what does vacation mean to you, Jeffrey? Well, I'm spending time with my brother in Victoria on the West Coast, so uh, it's mostly reading, writing, and walking, and talking, and, mm -hmm. and eating, I guess, but on a diet, so there's a bit less of that. <laughs> I think this time of summer in particular, and I, I know Europeans are, I, I've heard that they practice this uh, a bit more rigorously, becomes a, a kind of full-time vacation as, as, as you get into the month of August. Um, I don't know if it's still the case, but uh, I understood that just culturally people take the whole month off, uh, and that's kind of when you take your vacation. It's very foreign to the, the American mindset where, you know, you get two weeks, uh, you know, for, for personal vacation, one week maybe for holidays and, and sick days. But there isn't, you know, vacation seems to be something you have to eke out. No, it, it, it is different, Mark. I, I, will, I will admit that France shuts down in August. That's when it's the, the Grand Volcans and everybody's gone. And you can forget it. When I was working European projects, you just had to plan in that you couldn't do anything with your French partners in, in, in August. And according to the vacation law in Germany, um, you are, it is, it is suggests not required. It's like one step before the requirement that your, uh, your employer cannot refuse you. And it is encouraged that you take at least three weeks at one time. That, that's, that's the encouragement that is, that is given to you. The, the minimum re, uh, vacation days in, uh, in Germany is 23 by law. But most places have, that's working days, but um, uh, most places have more. When I was working at uh, Dekra, I started off with 30, but by the time I, I finished 18 years later, I had 32 days that uh, were mandatory. And, and that didn't count the time I took off for whatever overtime I accumulated because I had to take comp time for that, which was also required. So. I, I do recall a couple of times. Nice. I, yeah, it is. I recall a couple of times I took off December and January because I had to eat up time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, it wasn't much as a vacation because once you're home and don't have all those appointments, you're fried. You know, so <laughs> I guess that was practice for retirement. I just didn't realize it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I find the American way of doing things unconscionable. Uh, I, I had a colleague from the last place I worked in America. She went to a, a small software company and, and she had this one of these uh, 
you could choose your benefits kind of thing. It was one of those mix and match choosy kind of things. But uh, you know, all she got was five days off a year, sick or vacation she could choose. <laughs> so, <laughs> or the okay. illness could choose, <laughs> whatever. Or, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't always your choice, but it's presented as one. So, you know, what are you complaining about? <laughs> she, so, she didn't stay there very long. Gone off to other things. But. How are you doing, John? Excellent. How are you? All right. Jeffrey's on vacation, and so uh, we were just <laughs> chatting a bit about uh, different vacation practices and policies. Which is not the same thing as being unemployed. <laughs> Having a lot of time on your hands, <laughs> but no money. Uh, well, you have, you have of plenty of money, but no time. It just seems to be the, the, the rhythm of uh, late stage capitalism. Yeah. yeah, that's the other side. That's another side of the coin. That's for sure. Well, that's a, perhaps a good segue as well into uh, a topic for today. Uh, I um, wrote something out for the cafe, for the, for the forum. Um, this is a big topic course. Uh, and so I, um, I want to do a little bit of work perhaps at the beginning of this to hone it, hone it down a little bit, focus it uh, a bit, uh, because you know, how do we decide is very, very generic. Uh, ontology is a very broad topic as well. And self-governance, well, we'd have to ask, what is governance? What is the self? Uh, and perhaps what is even governable what's the field in which in which this kind of discussion is relevant uh, so I will read what I wrote just to just to start out and make a comment or two uh, but then see if we can try to bring some directionality some some um, some coherence to the and focus uh, to the topic uh, so that it becomes something that I hope we can build upon uh, over a series of conversations. So the question was, how do we decide the, the ontology of self-governance? And I ask, how does a group, any group, make collective decisions and act with coherent intentionality? What notions of self and other shape different kinds of groups? Uh, what axioms regarding the nature of reality, and how do these fundamental conceptions, and then parenthetically of, of self, other, being, energy, consciousness, mind, time, power, will, the good, etc., in parentheses, inform how the group relates to its environment and how its members interact with one another. What are our relative experiences of making group decisions on different scales, from local to global? And going meta, how do we, as CAFE participants, this group here, make even simple decisions, such as what is our topic for the week? What are we assuming when we do so? How do our relatively informal acts of self-governance open and close different possibilities? And then, as I mentioned, I'm proposing this as preparatory for later, more concrete discussions on how cosmos itself as a cooperative will govern itself, or how we uh, as um, constituent owners would use the tools of governance to express ourselves, and I could add, fulfill our purposes, create something greater than ourselves, however we might, uh, or cosmos might, uh, define the aims and objectives of, of, of the cooperative. Uh, but for this discussion, I prefer not to get into that level of detail and kind of operational you know, concerns. I wanted to see if we could tie together some of the themes we've, we've been discussing over this whole series of, of cafes uh, with the, um, what, I, what for me, at least, is an objective, which is to grow an organization that has a kind of collective intelligence and a kind of self-governing capacity. 
And in order to, to do that, I feel that the participants in an organization um, logically uh, need to have a, co a coherent and a compatible uh, vision and understanding of what the terms of that engagement even are. And so I want to make one um, remark or uh, make, make one connection to another conversation that I think we're going to have uh, potentially have in, in a couple of weeks. I posted a topic about a, um, a, a framework that's in the, in, the, in the making called CoGov, uh, which is being built on this distributed or decentralized um, technology called Holochain. And uh, I don't want to talk about that either uh, today. But there was one um, thing that I learned uh, when I went to this hackathon a, a couple of weeks ago about Holochain that brought to mind discussions that we've had here in the cafe and I think tie into this question of ontology and what kind of self are we talking about when we talk about self-governance. Um, one of the... Dis one of the um, architectural features that distinguishes Holochain from what's known as blockchain, which we discussed a little bit in our talk on democracy.earth uh, a few months ago, is that Holochain has a conception of data that is user-centric or agent-centric, they call it, um, compared to blockchain being data-centric. And so what that looks like practically is that in order for something to be considered true on the blockchain, all of the participants in it have to come to consensus that, that piece, a piece of data is true. And then that piece of data gets written to this literal, not literal chain of data called the block. It, it gets written to a block, which gets added to the chain. And that chain is the same for everybody. And so Holochain is different because the integrity of the network happens at the local or the individual node level. So the agent, the participant in the network, has to be in integrity with themselves. In other words, their own chain of data has to demonstrate a, a self-consistent integrity, which then allows it to interact with the network on a basis of, of trust. So I'm not sure if that was made totally clear, but this is where the connection came in is that in a commonly shared blockchain where everybody is drawing on the same data set, there is one version of time. So all of the blocks in that chain are being written to the chain sequentially in the same time frame. Whereas in the, the holo chain, agent-centric uh, architecture, each agent has their own time. And so then the result of that is that, one, I mean, on a practical level, the holo, holo chain architecture is a lot more efficient. Uh, it's a lot faster than the blockchain because you don't have to get every, sing, every single node to agree on one version of truth and be operating in, on one time, which means reconciling across diverse times because every agent is keeping their own time, just like we are in different time zones. So it makes it more efficient on that level. But it also allows for different kinds of configurations to occur and for different ways of groups to form their own uh, collectives, their own realities with each other without having to conform to a universal standard. And the Holochain provides the, the, um, the protocol or the, um, uh, basically the means to validate that each of the agents is in integrity with itself. So I found this very interesting because I thought that the way that we've been operating has a lot implicit in it. Uh, and that although we're not working at the technical technological layer, uh, we are perhaps enacting certain principles and certain ontologies or architectures in our interactions. And what I would be, what I would like to do, uh, what I would like to have happen in this particular call is for some of those assumptions, some of those principles uh, to be articulated 
so that we could better understand them and work with them. And with that, I will open up the table to uh, any conversation. Could, could, could I ask you to repeat that last part? You said, did you say anything about the epistemology? I'm sorry, I was making a cup of coffee and I missed something that you said. I didn't say anything about epistemology. Oh, okay. But we could bring yeah. that in. Okay, and what was the, what was the uh, desired statement, the desired outcome? I, I, I said that I think some, that, some of those assumptions. I, I said that I think that although we're not, we have not been explicitly in this cafe and in other interactions we've had because we, we have different spaces, read, different reading spaces, writing spaces, editing spaces, kind of proto governance aspects. Um, we, we, I believe, are operating with principles, assumptions, ideas uh, that we haven't fully articulated, uh, okay. some of which have so, been articulated in some places. Um, so you want some of those assumptions to, to be articulated? Yes. And this today? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to be sure I got that down. Mm -hmm. Thank I you. I have a question, Marco. I don't fully understand this idea of being consistent with oneself. Um, can you do anything more with that? I mean, to sort of, how does one determine if one is consistent with, you know, how does one, what sort of measure is used to determine this? I'll try to answer that from the perspective of Holochain, what I understand of it, because I'm not a developer of it. So this is my understanding at the architectural level. But it, in Holochain, it has to do with cryptography. And so it's fairly you know, mathematically complex. But the idea is that your own, your own data is cryptographically assured against itself. And if it becomes tampered with, that becomes evident because you've broken another kind of cryptographic link to the distributed data set that is held by the chain as a whole. Okay. So the way that that, I think, maps has to do not so much with our external data or you know, what could be written to a hard drive, but perhaps with our psychological data. And I, I think that it's suggestive of, uh, um, I think it's suggestive of this. I don't think that it ex exactly translates, but that in a network, in a cooperative network that presupposes uh, individual agency at the same time as a, um, uh, a, a communal or a collective context, that there has to be a, um, a basis of self-consistent integrity that is either assumed or cultivated or presupposed in order for the network itself to have integrity. But, but I think what you're saying is that the cryptographic keys that protect uh, the data in the blockchain are assigned to the unit of data, but in the hollow chain, they're assigned to the agent who's Correct. manipulating the data. That's mathematically underneath what's going on. Something like that, but I wouldn't be the person to speak yeah. for hollow chain, but that's, that's my understanding. Basically. So, so I, you want us to articulate our assumptions that this group my have about what exactly i'm just trying to get your mm -hmm. get clear about what my assumptions what my assumptions are mm -hmm. i don't assume what everyone else's assumptions are so i sort of have to do a an internal sort of check-in to mm -hmm. like okay well i guess i assume this and i wonder if anybody else does mm -hmm. that would be my but there would be some sort of internal processing that i have to sort of go through to satisfy i think your intention Mm -hmm. um, and and you've explained this hollow chain, and you've explained um, blockchain and some of the major differences. Um, hollow chain mentions the agent, and the agent has its own time, and it's different from 
the blockchain, where it's which is driven by consensus, um, and there's only with only one version of time. So those are the differences. Um, but 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 I'm curious about, it, and this may have something to do with my my um, my assumptions. <laughs> um, what is the status of the agent? Is the agent different from a node? Um, is the agent different from self? And ontology and self? And is there a relationship between that self and epistemology? Um, and my assumptions are that you can't ha you can't even talk about ontology without epistemology. Um, to me, they're flip sides of one coin. That's my metaphor. This I, I'm not assuming everyone else assumes. Actually, I think there are huge uh, cultural wars fought around these kinds of topics, and I'm, I'm, it wouldn't be my expectation that we would come anywhere close to a consensus about this. Um, but I'm in, I'm very interested in. Um, how do you know that? Actually, that's the question I ask most often about myself and about others. And how do you know that? And it's not a trick question. It's just like, I'm extremely curious about how persons know what they know when they're talking about self, justice, ontology, ethics, governance. These are like you say, huge uh, concepts. And I find that something about there's to me, how do you know that? This is just me, and this may be totally idiosyncratic. There's something very personal in that kind of question. How do you know that? That I believe starts to cross, cross over into the felt, into the affective, um, and that uh, generates a, a connection to what I think some of us, and this is another assumption, some of us might refer to as, as a field. And I think that um, there are many different fields that we can contact for different purposes. Um, but I often have found, and I think, um, and I'm sure you guys have felt this too, you're in an organization and um, they're the field Although you may not be able to articulate what the rules are, but you know when you violate one because everyone gets real quiet. <laughs> and you've learned how to um, uh, orchestrate your, af your affective, you, you can modulate your affects in order to um, make the expectations of the group uh, a, a more um, lively one or one that's more compatible. With, you, with what you value. But if your boss has different values from you and you want to stay employed there, you got to be real flexible. So these are the kind of things I wonder about governance and uh, does a group like what we are now or what we might become need such a, a concept uh, as I believe most of us are, are fairly, this is another assumption of mine, fairly on the spectrum of Toward, moving towards anarchy when we're at when we're at our best <laughs> but we're not at our best that's <laughs> something else entirely I don't even want to go there <laughs> but I think that um, um, the question of elegant anarchism is very very important to me and to, to what I value and I am maybe assuming more than I should that others value that as well because God for all I know you guys may be Real hardcore conformists want everything to, to, to please the boss as much as possible. <laughs> so that's my two cents. I hope that opens up the, the space a little bit. I am trying to move towards coherence rather than incoherence. I think there can be something in between coherence and incoherence, a kind of phase space that can be useful. Well, let me bring in something more on governance, uh, because I think that if we talk about governance, we have to acknowledge the ungovernable. There, there are perhaps aspects of reality that can be governed or, or that govern themselves, 
in their own in whatever ways that they have and there are aspects of reality that that do not um i think one of the interesting things i'm bringing back into my own thinking from aurobindo is this notion of will where does will come from how does how is will constituted in a society, will is important. The, the collective will, the popular will, or the, you know, the will of the, the powerful. Uh, so will is constituted in very complex and dynamic ways, uh, but it could be coming from different places. It can be coming from different kind of minds. Uh, so if Aurobindo is right, then there could be a supramental will, which uh, acts in the world in some way. Uh, and likewise, there can also be a will of ignorance or uh, inconscience, as, as he calls it, because that also participates in and expresses conscious force, or al- <laughs> to use a, a phrase that's not so popular, uh, ultimate reality. Uh, I, I think you know, one interesting concept that could be helpful to, to a discussion like this, uh, I've linked to a, a piece called um, uh, Governance, Not Governments, or I think that was the title. But the piece begins, it's by Arthur Brock, who's one of the uh, developers of Holo, Holochain, uh, which is why, you know, this, this, uh, this is on my mind. Um, but he writes that governance is always happening. So I think you know, in my own body, all my cells are governing themselves. I'm not consciously thinking about it, but they're uh, taking care of their own operations. They're interacting with each other. They're, they're, they've formed into larger aggregates that perform functions for the body as a whole. And this entire organism uh, is a self-governing uh, entity. But it is also participating in contexts and environments which have different forms of governance uh, that operate at different scales. Uh, so I don't think about it. I walk out the door and uh, walk down the sidewalk and there isn't garbage everywhere. It's being picked up. Uh, and that's a function of the governance of the, the, local, um, the local community, my, my city. And that, that is happening on, on all levels, not all levels, but at least all human levels. But at some levels, it, it's not happening or it's not happening particularly well, perhaps because we're just emerging into, into those stages, like the planetary level. Uh, there are planetary level issues that arguably require planetary governance, but which are, are not being addressed uh, by an effective planetary governance. And insofar as we're participants on, on the planet, and we would have some um, stake in the outcomes of those kinds of decisions that would be made, uh, one question, which I think the Democracy Earth people were asking, was how do we meaning how would we meaningfully participate on that scale of decision making? And their argument was that you would require this kind of technology that could be distributed and had various forms of val- verification and validation of of the identities on it and their intentions. And so it it goes, I think, from the microscopic and if Aurobindo is right, even the atomic as proto forms of self-governance all the way to the planetary and perhaps the the, the cosmic. Uh, And in this context, we're a relatively small group, uh, but we are doing things. We're organizing these events and potentially publishing books and posting things online. We're participating, even if in in a very limited way and with limited capacities in a, in a wider discourse, we're on a, you know, a wider network. And, and so I, I, I think that um, uh, looking at our assumptions, including our epistemologies, how do we know what we're doing? How do we know who we are? How do we know what this is or what it wants or what should be done? Uh, t- I, I feel that it, it is important to do. And, um, it may not mean that Cosmos as a cooperative, you know, has a particular structure or a particular technology that defines a, you know, governance system. It may mean something more, a lot more anarchic uh, than that. 
and um, I think my own pre, you know, sensibilities uh, leans in that direction. At the same time, anarchy can sometimes slide into chaos and a feeling of incoherence, a feeling that there isn't that something ungovernable is is uh, um, kind of at, at work or at play, uh, and 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 it becomes, I think, uh, and this is per- on the personal, important to um, work that out in some way so that we can more e- be more effectively, I think, pursue our own and our collective um, goals. I kind of feel the need to step in just because um, when we started the conversation, I had one thing to say. And after Johnny talked, I had maybe three things to say. And after Marco has talked, I have like five things to say. And if somebody else talks, I'm going to forget. The <laughs> <laughs> whole chain is going to go haywire. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, you know, I agree more or less with everything that Johnny said to start with, you know, and obviously we we have some of the same readings behind it because Bateson is an epistemologist primarily. And of course, so you have this idea that ontology is about the nature of things and epistemology is about the knowledge of the nature of how, uh, knowledge and how do you know the nature of things. So obviously the two are intimately linked and we have these conversations, you know, extensive conversations about ontology, but we often neglect these days the epistemological issues, um, which are at least as important, if not more, and perhaps harder to get a handle on. Uh, and, and maybe that's partly why we ignore them to some extent. But uh, anyway, so I do think the epistemological arg- argument is important. Um Another comment I had about what it was the one I had to start with on the hollow chain. So, um, so m- as a professional career, I work in the area of essentially spatial data. Uh, and the issue with spatial data in machines or however you manage the data is that there are two ways to manage spatial data. There are global data structures and there are local data structures. And for many, many years, the only ones that were effective were global data structures, where every spatial element is located in the same database and all of the intersection and and relationships are located in the same database because there weren't very good local data structures. But in the last 20 years or so, um, a number of much more local data structures have, have emerged in the, in the field of spatial data. And they allow you to isolate small parts of the spatial landscape in its own database and have these then speak to other databases in order to work out what's going on. They don't have to be all put together into a global database. And the problem with global data structures is the same thing that we see with Bitcoin, is they they become extremely expensive to run because everything has to be mapped against everything else. And the bigger the system gets, it grows exponentially in terms of its costs. So small Bitcoin, as what the way it started, as relatively small efforts were, were relatively cheap. But now the whole... Bitcoin and blockchain approach has become a bit of a monster. The costs have gone through the roof as a result because it's all this exponential stuff. So the hollow chain clearly has the local properties which allow the cost to be maintained at a a reasonable level without going through, having the cost go through the roof all the time. I mean, cost in this sense is not just uh, uh, financial costs, but also management costs, storage costs, uh, you know, all of those other forms of costs that are also contained by Holochain. So Holochain is clearly a, um, a more sustainable, I, I believe anyway, from my understanding of things, a more sustainable way to go. The, the downside is 
on the blockchain, you get everything knows about everything else. Whereas in the hollow chain, you now have pockets and places where what goes on over here doesn't know what's going on over there. And so that's the, 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 the downside, which comes to my third comment. Uh, I, I believe I'm still on track. <laughs> so Marco was talking about um, uh, those, the, those are areas that are ungovernable. So in my series of books, I have one of the books is to vote is called actually it's called shadow casting and it describes a movement that emerges. There are essentially people who, who are unmanageable or who, who oppose what's going on, but who oppose it in a way that they don't necessarily want to participate in what's going on. They just want to express, you know, a different opinion or, or whatever. So it's a kind of an anti-governance kind of thing. Um, and, so, you know, and obviously shadow is a Jungian concept, at least partially, or, or f even Freud to some extent, but it's a, it's a concept that came out of the psychological literature. But human beings do have a shadow side. And I think governance has a shadow side of people who simply do not want to participate in the common efforts and any system that tries to build in governance that covers everything is going to fail as a result. So that's, maybe I'll stop there because uh, I could probably go on through several other topics. But. But that was only three or five, Jeffrey. Uh, I would be interested in the other two. <laughs> I've forgotten the other two. <laughs> <laughs> They'll come back. <laughs> I'll go ahead and say hello. <laughs> and um, so uh, I came in late and I also have zero cumulative knowledge of this other than what I've been participating here and there on this side and um, a little bit outside. I like the, well, I'm using it as a metaphor now of the local and global data collection you just talked about. It almost seems to coincide with local omnivore or local foods movement, local like just bringing um, not necessarily, I guess, governance, not government, but bringing governance into local communities that we, we mentioned this in the Arobindo conversation, um, or I mentioned it that Don Salmon mentioned it, that his community is, could potentially have its own um, bubble to a certain extent where it, it's self-sustaining as members that are participating in productive ways rather than clashing against one another. Uh, so I just want, that, that was a thought I had. I thought that was interesting. And I'm coming off of, uh, I had two hours at the, the local tire place here. I, I had to get new tires, waste a lot of money on that, but um, I had time to review the previous cafe conversation and the listening society was brought up again. I think you brought it up, Marco, but one of the first steps that he talks about and in order to step into what we're stepping into here and in order to step into the field of how do we bring about a healthy governance, government, what, which, whichever form you'd like to use, government or governance, um, is to step away from essentialism, to step away from, on a personal level, my view is right and you're wrong, or to step away from the political dynamics, and that's talked about in the the hollow chain guys piece that you posted, Marco, where we're limited by 
these divides. Um, and I'll stop there. That's all I want to say right now. Well, just to support a couple of things that you just said, Doug, the, this, like a specific example of the divides is the progressive and conservative divide. Mm -hmm. Because Arthur argues that in life, a living organism or a community of organisms has to do both, always. There's always the need to change, to adapt as conditions and the environment changes. And there's always, so that's the progressive aspect. And there's also always the need to conserve, uh, to preserve not only life, but resources, energy, etc. cetera. Uh, so it makes no sense to choose one or the other as as a predominant approach, there's always going to be an interplay bet between them. And, and then the local global, uh, I think that, that that's um, also really interesting because I think what part of what is happening and part of I know what has motivated me to p invest a lot of time and energy and effort into, into, this, into this project is a feeling that uh, the kind of governance that should be happening in the wider society uh, is not happening. And I asked, well, why isn't that? Uh, there, there's, something, there's something wrong structurally when information is not able to flow or when will is not able to be established or constituted in a way that actually includes and reflects the actual community. Uh, and so as a result, we, just I'll put quotes around the we, feel alienated from the decisions that are made on the basis of that will or that you know, supposed will. Uh, and that kind of en engenders this, this conflict, right? That I think you know, we're, we're all living through uh, in one way or another. And it seemed to me that we, again, we, I'm just putting them in quotes because it's always like kind of the, the, the issue. Um, have to find ways of, of governing that despite the, the dysfunction, you know, and despite the, um, uh, the, the, the malpractice uh, of governance at, at the local, state, national, and global, global scales, that we can't wait for one party or another to figure it out. We have to work on our own solutions, uh, and that has to happen through an, Im through an imminent process. It has to happen not by designing a better system and then hoping other people adopt it, but by doing it ourselves. That, that I think, is an important part of it. Um, so, again, that's just to, I think, reflect back on the local side. Like, what is happening in the food movement, movement is that instead of depending on mega corporations to mass produce, you know, factory farmed monocultural kind of food products, which are arguably not even, you know, may not even be food. They're just, they keep the body somehow going, but for calories, um, local communities decide we can, we, we can manage the land ourselves and create community around our own food sources. And, uh, uh, you know, declare a certain amount, not full, but a certain amount of independence from those systems that, that don't be, seem to be serving our actual needs or don't even seem to care about our, our actual needs. Well, I, I'm, I think it was Bateson who talked about what do you do when you don't know what to do? And he thought the best, best persons on the planet are children in that regard because they don't know what to do. They've never been in this situation before. And so they're open in sometimes ways that the elders around them are not when they are confronted with something that they don't know what to do. So um, I don't think there's any, are any good role models or models or um, 
you know, practices, best practices here. I think we have to uh, just recognize that we're, we need to experiment. And um, I think it was Manning said, um, speculative pragmatics, just got to speculate a whole hell of a lot and guess. Educated guesses are extremely important when you're in a situation that you've never been in before. I think that's happening more and more often to more and more of us that we're just in situations we've never been in before. And there doesn't seem to be a consensus. And if, you know, if the consensus is working, why, why fuck around with it? No. But if the, it's the systems that um, are breaking down and sometimes dramatically, we're going to need visionaries. Uh, otherwise, I think visionaries should be, you know, are not that necessary, really, except in special occasions. I just think we are collectively uh, reaching those uh, those kinds of occasions where, you know, the left and the right and the, the political establishment and the governing class, they all seem to be pretty clueless right now. So I would just like... To, just briefly, something that uh, Brian Musumi said, that's Aaron Manning's partner, um, about science and, and, and literature. He was saying scientific and literary discourses do not fit, but overlap. He, he went on to say scientists do not expect the discourses of diverse fields of study simply to emerge, nor should we do so in studying the relations of literature and science. It is by placing them athwart each other, that new patterns are discovered. And he, and he also said, and I think what he's saying about literature and science is also true of, of politics and literature and science. Um, because I think politics is contaminated um, both literature and science. Uh, but I think he also said, uh, if anything goes, nothing will happen. So we do have to create risk constraints so that we can learn something. You can't have freedom without constraints. This is an old Batesonian principle that I think is very useful here. So I think it's great if we, can, if we can constrain ourselves, new features can start popping up that we would not have noticed if we hadn't constrained ourselves. And every creative act has something that's constraining it, that makes it a creative act. Just making a sentence up, it's going to make sense that some sentences that we say every day we've never said before, never heard before, but we somehow can make sense of it because of syntax, which most of us, of course, are quite unconscious of, but we still operate with those, those constraints so that we can make sense, some kind of sense um, with one another. But I think now we certainly have to chunk down. I, I keep stressing, and I don't know if this is something that we may need to, these are some of the assumptions that I'm using that may be useful. And maybe some of you guys are using them too, but I think chunking down and chunking slow and creating experiments that are safe to fail rather than creating experiments that if you fuck up, the whole thing goes down the tubes. I don't think we should be doing much of that. <laughs> if we're going to experiment, let's be sure it's okay if it fails. We don't need Fukushima or uh, Nagasaki or Chernobyl. And I think that's where I, I believe we can do something useful at. And how in the world are we going to scale this up? I don't even know if that's even desirable. So that's why I'm thinking that old school governance stuff we learned in school about I, pledging allegiance to America just isn't going to work anymore. Um, because Even though I'm charmed by this new um, potential congresswoman from the Bronx. Her name is uh, Alexandra Cortez. Does anyone know about her? She just had a landslide victory against her her uh, opponent who was, had been in the house for 20 years and was supposed to be the next um, to take over Pelosi's place, the next speaker of the house. He didn't even show up for a debate with this young woman and, and she went 20 points ahead of him and declaring herself as a, as a socialist. And uh, she won across all de demographics. So I think this is a, maybe a minor, this isn't a major gesture, this is actually, this isn't a minor gesture quite major to have won this primary. But I think that um, her campaign, if you listen to her talk about it, emerged out of very many minor gestures that she made. And she ignored the good advice of a lot of people. 
and she was very much a co coalition kind of person. And she was working as a bartender a year before she started her campaign. So I just think those are kinds of, I think that that makes me want to pay attention to, or not pay attention, but give attention to uh, what, what she's doing. I think she's doing something right. So even though I don't have much respect for politics, I still think that you can have these little um, anomalies occur that I think are, are, are messages from the field that something else wants to happen. If we, and if we give enough attention to it, um, we may cultivate the conditions where that might happen more and more often. So thank you for a chance to improv here. It's a very difficult topic. What, what's her name again? Uh, Alexandra Cortez. She has a middle name. I can't remember her middle name. Do you remember it, Marco? Ocasio, Ocasio Cortez. Ocasio, I believe. Al Alexandra Ocasio, Ocasio Cortez. Ocasio. Ocasio. Yeah, there was a, a write-up in the board. New York magazine that was pretty good the other, last yeah, month, maybe. She's very articulate and very attractive, too. So. I, had, I think she has a great future. Ocasio Cortez, yeah. Try to download uh, Hollow Chain and, and have a look at how it's put together here. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go for it. I mean, it might be worth seeing if one could get something up and running and you know, see, see, see how it works. I've just poking around the site and it, it seems like there are some downloadable packages and things that one presumably could get up and running. but. Uh, I'll try it, but um, I'm not. I'm not a computer pro, but uh, I might be able to figure it out. You know. Part of my vacation activities. <laughs> well, there, there are definitely some cultural um, changes that uh, could change how the politics is played out. And I think Ocasio-Cortez uh, may represent that. Female, Latina, et cetera. Part of the... She's 28 years old. She'll be the youngest congresswoman ever elected. I think maybe even the youngest congressperson. Very young. So, 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 so that's, that's great. Um, I, I've, myself have felt more alienated from democratic politics and I pay attention and tonight I'll probably go to city council to support something that my neighborhood uh, would like with respect to zoning and like, uh, but uh, one of the arguments is that the very systems that we have for making collective decisions, this is just at the, nas like the national level, is, n is not capable of handling the amount of information, the pace of events, uh, and, and, and also the, the size and the diversity of the population that would need to be consulted or be a part of that decision making. So we have what you know, Brock argues is a agrarian level system, but we're living in an information level age. So what would, um, what would governance look like? How would we need to reconstitute our civic structures and our, and our um, procedures, you know, for coming to collect the collective decisions about things? Uh, to actually reflect the amount of information that has to be dealt with and the complexity of the, the problems and, and so forth. Um, like, like Ocasio-Cortez, like, you know, has a certain pol policy platforms that are popular with certain people like uh, Medicare for all, uh, free college education, etc. Actually, her positions are not if in the European context, they wouldn't be that radical at all. Uh, so, uh, you know, what I think, um, you know, she represents in context of American politics is, uh, 
you know, more daring perhaps. Um, but it, it, it you know, it, it it doesn't actually address the systemic uh, dimension of, of things. And you know, I think that you know, part of you know, that systemic dimension also, also has to do with our conceptions of who we are. And this, to get back to the ontology uh, part of this. So a representative uh, democracy um, is presuming that it's presu- first of all, it's presuming a certain kind of agency amongst you know the in- individual citizens, but then it's also presuming that that agency can be represented, uh, and that those representatives can effectively channel the will uh, or the desires of 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 their constituents, their constituent groups, and. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, um, I'm not so concerned with that. Uh, like in, in the context of our, com- you know, our group here. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it's healthy to talk about politics. Um, if you could do it in a way that doesn't devolve into, you know, ideology. Like if, if we can, um, you know, observe and learn from what's happening and kind of read, read it as part of a larger story. Um, but I think that p- part of what is at stake is, and, and even in like this context, like it's the issue of not just being represented in decisions, but actually being, um, I'm trying not to lapse into using uh, jargony words, but uh, I want to say empowered or empowerment. I want to say something with respect to that. Because the act, for example, of doing a, a talk like this or of writing a piece that gets published or of uh, engaging in a, in a dialogue that that influences other people, that interacts with other people, like on the forum, where somebody can read it and come and com- comment on it, and it be- can begin to take on a life of its own. To me, that has an element of, of power in it, insofar as because there is this context, because there are these tools and technologies and these relationships that we're developing, we're able in a way to project ourselves into the world that we might not otherwise have that if you're on a platform like Facebook, for example, all of your, all of your activities are being commodified and monetized and extracted. And it's serving, it's serving an end that is not necessarily your own, but in a context like cosmos or holo chain or any number of other autonomous type um, contexts, the, the attention you give into the system and the, the power you invest into it has the opportunity to, to grow in a way that doesn't, that, that includes you rather than alienating you or acting over you, which is, I think, part of the experience that like somebody like Ocasio-Cortez is really a reaction to. It's an incumbent congressman who doesn't seem to be listening and who's you know part of the the party machine, and she comes as a as a voice of as a voice of the people, uh, and is a is a way for the people to. Again, I'm, I have to use all these terms in, in quotes because they're all, they're all kind of loaded. But it's a way to to participate in the world, to become imminent in the world. So. I, I mean, one uh, uh, assumption that I have, or one um, um, I guess, yeah, it, something that is implicit, I think, you know, f- for me is that part of what we're doing here is working with power, and we're experimenting 
hopefully in safe to fail ways. Um, but it's not, I think, at least for me, not just an idle kind of activity. It's not just an entertainment or diversion while the rest of, you know, Western you know, civilization continues on its course. I mean, it's meant to be a kind of intervention in the state of things, uh, but very direct and imminent because we're actually doing it ourselves. We're not advocating, advocating for somebody else to do it. I'm sort of curious about how, I mean, even if I look at these different technologies and their, what they offer in terms of governance, uh, um, it seems to be, so it, it's, I mean, they talk about it being a flat governance, but it seems to me that I, I don't understand how you can build governance for billions, billions of people on a flat system. It has to be hierarchical in some sense. You know, even if one is opposed to things being overly hierarchical, there's no way to do it without having some levels of people taking control over a certain level of governance and then passing the results up to some other level. I, I just don't see it happening in any in, in any other way. So I'm unsure how this how this really makes things different than the exist. You know, like uh, Block in his discussion talks about you know the fact that uh, you know people can't represent people. You know that the, the idea of having a representative representing millions of people doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, and that's right. That's true. But but find us an alternative that works. It's just not. It's just not clear to me what the alternative is at this point. So, I, well, what, scale, what scale are you thinking about? I mean, are you on a planetary scale or on, on more local? Well, even for a you know a, a state level or you know whatever um, you know major region, how do you get it to work with? You know, you know, a city like New York City, for instance, take Johnny's camp or Montreal, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's it's got a million and a half or I mean, New York's got a lot more than that. But uh, Montreal, I think, it's got about two million people. How do you get a system to go of governance to work for two million people without it being hierarchical in significant ways and therefore delegating power to a limited number of people, which is like it or not the system that we've got in whatever way it works, you know, whether it works well or, or poorly, that's a discussion. I have a, a future response maybe, um, but I'm waiting to see if anybody else would like to respond to that before I throw out my... Go, go for it, Doug. But you, you mentioned the quote from Bateson about children, how they're, they're new, how they can be a, a good place to start, or we can see ourselves as children if we want to reach out and expand. Hello, Lisa. Hi. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Good to see you. Yes, I missed you guys. I've been really busy with work, and then you took some time off, so good to be back. Hey, good to see you. We changed the time, by the way, so we actually started an hour ago, uh, maybe since the last time that you were on. Oh, sorry. That, no, it's totally cool, uh, but but we've been talking for a little while, and uh, we're talking about governance uh, in, or in systems and uh, groups of people, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> don't, okay. Don't continue. And I'm bringing it back to the level of the site for the future. I'm not imagining this happening within a year or two, but 
I'm interested in my children and the life that they're going to live in being actively involved, not as a helicopter parent, but I like this idea of, well, maybe they don't have to go to school. Maybe I can homeschool my children. I, I like having these options that seem to be popping up more and more. Um, maybe in my generation than in previous generations, it was the factory model school. And that's what you had two generations ago. Now you can pretty much be or do anything you want to be for better or for worse. So if going they're off, hiring, if they're hiring Doug, <laughs> that's true. we can't all be what we want to be. That's, that's, I think a very big myth. But I, I posted something that I took away because I think it took away from a conversation when we were, I think we were talking about something similar to, it was during the syndicate ideas and things like that. I think Marco might have been the only one to see it before I took it off. But um, it was this proposal that maybe we can have a, a separate website for children in which I'm very influenced by everyone here. I'm learning quite a bit. But I want, how am I going to introduce my children online? And how will they be, like, if they were part of a holo chain, are they going to be on equal status as, say, me or you? Um, I don't know how that works, and I haven't read into that part of it. How does it account for a newborn child? Or are they immediately thrown into the holo chain? Um, but I have this idea of metacyclist instead of metapsychosis, and there, there's going to be unicycles where they have their own piece that's the the single part there's bicycles which are maybe what heather and jeffrey are doing but the the one-on-one -on -one conversations that there can be like I, I would want my children to write letters to uh grandchildren of in germany or something like that learn german words just there's so much potential to be had and so that's that's something for the future there's there's all sorts of ideas that can sprout up like that but we wouldn't want our children or our grandchildren or whoever to be managing this website either because they're too young or they haven't emotionally developed. Um, so I don't know if this goes along with, with what you were talking about at all, Jeffrey, but it's maybe a future example of like, how would we manage that? Um, just even on a very small local level would be a, a huge challenge. Um, even if this site built up to, support that in some way or another. It would take moderators. It would take adult presence or elder presence. I don't know, but um, just wanted to throw that out there. Well, I might riff off the idea, which um, maybe I'm answering my own question, but um, although I don't think it's a full answer in any way, but uh, maybe the point is, you know, I sort of come back to field idea that Johnny was talking about earlier. Um, so I think about field activations. Um, now, field activations across a conversation with several people are not individuals. We're not talking about individuals, but there is a common discourse, a common understanding across several individuals. So maybe the point is the units of governments are not individual people, but these field effects. And that's what the governance has to be built on in order to, I mean, it's a kind of a crazy idea, but because I don't fully understand how that would work, but, but it's, anyway, it's an idea. I don't, can I just say something? I don't think it's a crazy idea, Jeffrey. And I, I do think it ties back into what Doug said and what, what Johnny brought up at the beginning. Children are the model. There is a model, John. It's children. They're always in the situation that they don't know what to do. They have to figure it out while they're in it. And that's precisely what happens, and this comes back to what you just said, Jeffrey, in a conversation. There's no, there's no one center in a conversation. 
But the conversation is also variably hierarchical because someone speaks and others listen. Another will speak and listen. And there's no, there's no established role for us. There's not one set hierarchy. It's a flexible hierarchy. And I think that's how children react to the world as well because they are sometimes part of it and sometimes not part of it. You know, it's, it's a kind of figure, it's a figuring out as you go along. And there's not, there's not, how do I say this? There's not some superordinate structure that the governs that. Because you, we, we do figure it out. When I think about how things happen here, like just in the cafes, how we decide on things, there's always an interaction. And one person will take a lead. Another person will follow up. Somebody else will do something. There's, there's always this shift of, um, of focus within the field, whatever it is that's being activated. But isn't that how it has to work? wherever it is that you are at the time that you find yourself there. And this is, and, and this is what I see happening in the larger scale of things. I agree with you 100%, Jeffrey. There's no way we can take into account 7 billion individuals and do it in some efficient manner so that all 7 billion, let us say, I'm going to look at this planetarily, have been given equal consideration. I, I don't see that happen. But I also have no problem with things that are relatively, not absolutely important to me, taking a secondary role because for the group I'm in, it's better when, when I do that. I simply push them to the background. That's just a normal state of adaptation to the, to the configuration in which I find myself. And I think that's what children do a lot as well. I, I don't think that there is a that there's a set answer. I think it's a fluid answer that we're always that we're always approaching. I think trying to define it maybe maybe expecting too much of us, uh, not just us like the people that are here, but just of us as human beings generally. Because I don't think we do that. I don't. I don't. And I also I also don't think it's necessary. We we have to we give and take and 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 and, and put in and take out. In, in a constant flow of things. And, and that, that giving and taking, putting in and taking out in a constant flow is actually the governance that we practice in. That, that's how we do it. We listen, we think, we act, we comment, others react. And it seems, well, this seems to be a good thing to do at the time. And we do it. And I don't know how else we're actually going to put together what it means to to do things that we don't know how to do because that's all we ever do anymore at least that's how i feel that i'm operating in in, in the world you know i'm constantly being confronted with new things i i don't mind being confronted with new things i actually think it's kind of exciting i my my grandson isn't articulate enough to tell me whether he thinks it's exciting but he's certainly making it exciting for me because that's what he's doing, you know. So, so I think it is a model, but I don't think we understand the model well enough. That was all I had to say on that. Thank you for articulating that much more clearly than I did, so. No. That's what I, that's what I thought I heard you say, <laughs> I, I think in, I, I like that. I like it in principle. I like it in spirit. Um, yeah. But l let's take a situation <laughs> like um, the Occupy uh, protests that occurred mm -hmm. in the United States and other parts of the world. Um, 2011, was it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you had yeah, this um, action, this event, this emergence that that occurred pretty spontaneously. I, I think it started with an article that uh, a Canadian magazine, Adbusters, uh, had written 
And somebody got the idea. The idea came into the field or into somebody, some individuals had, or a few individuals had to, to go and encamp uh, in a public square or semi-public square uh, and begin um, advocating for a set of ideas and advancing a set of critiques of the existing socioeconomic political uh, system. They showed up apparently without a plan, but they had to figure it out as, as they went along. And in the course of doing that, certain mechanisms came into play, like the, um, the, the, the assembly uh, kind of mechanism, the way of, um, the way of um, amplifying uh, an individual's voice, um, certain assumptions about how uh, you know, things would get done in the camp. I, mean, I, I understand a lot of things just happen because out of response to need. So people need uh, blankets, tents, food, etc. And spontaneously, people begin stepping in to fill those needs. But then there came to be the question of now what? We're here. Uh, you know, we can sustain this for, for so long. But how does this translate into the institutional level change that we say we're here for? And, and that's where I, I think that I mean, you know, there's a lot that could be said about the Occupy movement, but one of the things is that it, it didn't quite have the means to do that. It hadn't quite developed those skills or those structures or that self-understanding to be able to turn those particular events and into a bigger movement. Moreover, there was the institutional response, which actively... Which was paramilitary to... yeah. troops motorcycles and clubs and they're hitting you on the head right over right and over and over again <laughs> that's what i'm and i saw it thing. and i was there on the ground okay it yeah was, it's, the, the... i'm my, my system goes flooded with affects once again and we've talked about the individual the pre-individual and the trans individual we've talked also and i think maybe this i'm, I'm wanting to add this to I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. but no, I, I, was, I, I was being triggered because I was flooded with affects. <laughs> yeah, well, I was I was dovetailing with exactly that point that it was also dismantled. When we were talking, when we were talking about how inadequate Occupy was, we have to also point to other features in the landscape which were very active in destroying Occupy. They didn't succeed, but they had. We're talking about Bloomberg the United States government, the city of New York, and they were doing everything they could to persecute this group of people and anyone who allied themselves with that group. So I marched with them and I remember the beginning of it. It's very much like for months and months and months, people were like, why doesn't somebody do something? <clears throat> you know, it's a typical response. Um, isn't any, well, look at this atrocity. Isn't anyone gonna do something? And, and eventually when we started to see some signs of life, and that, that people were congregating and they were marching with slogans, you know, and yelling and chanting the same old way that they've always done in every demonstration you've ever been a member of. And we were marching down, um, probably we didn't even know where we were going, but we kept marching downtown towards City Hall. And, you know, you start hearing your voices in unison amplified down these big canyons you know, with all these skyscrapers. So your, your voices are coming back to you. And then the, the louder you shout, the louder the voice comes back to you. And then there are voices all around you. There is something I think that's um, trans-individual that starts to happen because it's not about me and my personal suffering or the atrocities or the, the miserable conditions that I've been in and that I've had to create within those conditions. It became much more about that we space, that, that sort of amorphous, we can't really figure out what it is. It is when we're referring to a we space. But when it gets coherent, it's very palpable. And uh, it scares the shit out of people who run this country. And they will do everything they can to stop it. So I think we, when we talk about why, they were, why Occupy was so incompetent and unprepared, we also have to think, I think, about a, a parallel um, event that's happening when reparation, when um, Black Lives Matter and certain persons in Black Lives Matter 
want to get up reparations from the United States government for the enslaving of black people. And there's a dilemma there. And I think it's the same dilemma that um, Occupy had to deal with. And that's petitioning the government, which is responsible for creating the conditions for the atrocity to then change, change their minds somehow um, in a way that's going to, to benefit the group that you're advocating on behalf of. Uh, and I think the reparations is, I, and this is why I think Fred Moten, who uh, Aaron, Aaron McDonald quoted a lot, and I want to read his book, he was dealing with that dilemma because if you demand reparations and you get them and they pay you off, then what happens? Has anything changed? Besides you may be, if you're one of the, that group, you may have some bucks in your pocket that you didn't have before. But basically, I think he's raising the question to another octave maybe, something that, that the ethical um, demands and that you can't just pay off that kind of thing. And then when you, if you're paying off that group, what happens, what happens to other groups? What happens to gay people? I was spit on. I was told that I, they, they, they told me that they wished I had never been born than to be a queer and church and state and the medical establishment all in, in, in agreement that we can use this group of people to use experimental drugs on. Uh, and if they get wiped out, it doesn't matter. They're going to die anyway. I heard medical doctors say this. <clears throat> so I'm just saying, when does this stop? You know, and how do we address these uh, large, uh, these very, very large questions when we're really up against it as individuals? We can't. But as trans individuals, I think that pre-individual aspect of us, that trans individual aspect of us is very fluid. Uh, and who is the, where is the sense of the agency in all of this interplay? I think it's these field effects. Um, these fields can develop their own kind of uh, autonomy in a way, and they can take over and they can become a mob. Um, and if you don't have a strong center, that can easily occur that you can become a part of this mob. Or if you have a strong center and you know what you want, you've articulated clearly, the field might, might support you in very mysterious but very effective ways. I think like uh, Alexandra Cortez getting elected, or not getting elected but winning the primary, is an excellent example of someone who is extremely centered and who opened herself to the field. And I think she got a, a huge response. She won by 20 points, you know, the, her, her very uh, well-funded, uh, um, the man who was running against her, the incumbent. So anyway, I'm just bringing this up because I think we're, we have to deal somehow with these paradoxes of the self. And I don't think you can do that by equating the self with a node in a network. Uh, and you mentioned earlier about this, the objectives um, the objective that this system has, uh, this organizational objective. And I'm just curious, well, what is an objective? What's the relationship between an objective and a desire? You know, I hate to sound like Cornel West here, <laughs> but you know, you desire freedom. You, you, you will you'll give your life for some things so that other, peoples can ha other people can have. I just think about the transcendentalist movement, the, those abolitionists who uh, were opposed to slavery and they were considered crazy and they risked a great deal to uh, abolish slavery. And, and I think it started small and had these like butterfly effects. And I came out at a very early age and I came out almost every day to somebody different. And it was almost 99% unpleasant. Because sometimes you come out to people and they liked you before you came out, then they don't like you anymore. Or they get incredibly embarrassed. Why didn't you tell me before? That kind of thing. And it was just like, oh my God, do I have to do this again today? But I did. I thought, well, it's my integrity, my honesty. I have to be as clear as I can in as many situations as I can, even if I get penalized socially for it. And I wasn't the only one who was doing that. Many others decided to do the same. And I think that's where you know, you, you put yourself on the line. 
And I think there's something Manning said about that. What is that? that, that something about, but anyway, being affirmative doesn't necessarily feel good. I can't remember what you said, but it, something to do with affirmation. But affirmation doesn't always feel good. It feels maybe like shit, but that's part of being effective and affirmative at the same time. And how many people are willing to do that? For how many causes? Not that many. You're only going to find probably a handful who have some who identify with certain kind of causes and who will put themselves out there and take great personal risks to make something happen. And there's no guarantee that anyone, anything will happen after they take those great personal risks. I think this is something you addressed too, Jeffrey, in, in one of our calls, how you got engaged in a, in a movement and, there, and you, you took a, some high risks for that and even got punished for it, but that something, something in the field started to respond. So um, you have to pardon me if I get a little uh, over, <laughs> overstressed by this because I feel this very, very deeply that um, we are up against it. And I think the, I think our technology for how wonderful it is has made us incredibly passive. Why isn't someone doing something, you know? So I just hope that when we get together, we look at our differences and hold those differences and open ourselves up to our differences. And rather than trying to eliminate differences, which would get very boring really fast. But a lot of people like that. They like being in social spaces where there are no differences. I think we're very, we're not like that though. And so we, you asked earlier about what our assumptions are. And I think that's one of the assumptions that I'm trying to start to articulate is uh, getting groups of, together, small groups that come together for these calls and in the forums who actually enjoy difference and want to be different in a different way and to value the paradoxes that emerge when we start to articulate those, those differences. Um, not that we don't have our, uh, our moments where we melt down a little bit, but I think we've been able to be resilient enough that we, we can sort of come back from those setbacks. And I hope we'll continue, can you to continue to do that and do it even better than we've done before. So thank you. I hope that made sense. Well, that made a lot of sense, but I'm going to leave space for others to, to respond. Can I just add, add one thing there? I think the Occupy, whatever it was, was overly successful. I don't think it was a failure at all. And I think the measure of its success is how hard the institutionalized world came down on it. It had put its finger in a very, very, very raw wound directly. At the same time, and this comes back to what you said, Marco, if you institutionalize that, then you've become what you hate. I don't know if that step's even possible. I would like to think that it could expand or become more solidified or stronger or whatever. But I think the idea that was there was okay. Now they, and they figured out how to do this as they were going along, I understand that. But I do think it was successful simply because it has been relegated to obscurity. And so we don't think about it anymore, but maybe we should be thinking about what is it that they were actually doing there? They were looking and exploring, trying to find ways to amplify individual voices, find consensus within a reasonable amount of time, um, you know, little, just general principles on the one hand, but it was so threatening to, to what exists that it had to be dealt with severely. So this is where I also see the child again. I don't know any children that push it till the whole house comes falling down on. We, they learn, we learn to adapt and we learn to, to form's not the right way. We don't, yeah, just to adapt to our environments so that we can internalize something that helps us develop our own sense of self which is the point that I want to get to, because that's what the child is doing in all of that, is developing a sense of self. And at some point, the child has to realize, do I become a me or do I become, in this case, an institution? And I'm not sure that it can get beyond the me in that case. 
And so it does remain small and it remains local and remains fragile, but it's, but it's still, it still forms an identity that allows it to operate. The identity of Occupy was destroyed, therefore it cannot operate any. Okay, because there are ways to do that and it's done mostly by brute force. But the process that was involved there, I think was the correct one. And I think it was a, an interesting and illustrative way of thinking about how do we deal with the kind of questions that you brought up precisely in regard to governance for, for Cosmos. And that's why I see the link. Just to throw that in. Because you're right. I mean, every time you try and, because one of the discussions we had in the Manning discussion was how do we, you know, we talked about the Occupy and the, and the student movements in Montreal and, and how they sort of dissipated and how um, there didn't seem to be any sustainability to these movements. Um, but as you say, too much sustainability and it becomes an institution in its own right and then it becomes the opposite of what you're trying to do. And so maybe what we need to be looking at is the creation of, I mean, Johnny, you're talking about the pre-individual. Maybe we need to think, be thinking about the pre-institutional as, as, as what we build and not allow it to go to a full institution always keep it at the pre-individual level so it shifts to different forms. I don't know. Again, crazy idea. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. not, not so much. Go ahead, Marco, if you'd like to. No, no, no. I just but going off of what you said, Ed, there's, there's kind of the me of the child, of the movement, and each person that participated in the Occupy movement felt the we. It, it was the pre-institutional that developed into some sort of institutional form, but it was also what Simon Lund's talking about with the trans individual. It's forming a collective we. So it doesn't necessarily, it, it turned into an it, but it, it could have been continued as a we. And I, I'm not, don't think I'm using that in like the Wilberian terms of I, we, it, me, and all that more, more along Johnny's lines of me, exploring me, we, and the I, um, myself. But um, yeah, I think we're working on that as we speak right now. So you kind of have to stay with the movement, which is the whole perspective. And if you see it on different scales than on this Occupy scale, the movement was lost because it was identified. It, was, it became something. It became an it, and those that wanted to stick with the, the movement were pigeonholed through maybe media, through even themselves saying, well, maybe I, it's become too much of an institution, so I'm no longer going to identify with it, whatever it might be, and it dies down. Then it, it's bubbled back up in maybe the Trump world, at least here in America. But there's also all these other forms that are forma forming. Um, I'll stop there. Well, I, I think the pre-institutional is a really interesting idea and the we that forms there. What I, what I, um, and, and you, like maintaining access to that, I think is um, important uh, because I mean, part of what the institutional tries to do is to iron it out and to give it concretion, give it um, de determinate structure. We're going to talk on Thursday in the Aurobindo talks on determinate and uh, indeterminate and indeterminable aspects of, of the universe. Um, so I think that that pre-individual as well as the pre-institutional is the indeterminate. I think that's if we were to locate where the intelligence of the field is, it's there. Uh, and I think arguably it's ungovernable, um, which is not to say unrelatable. We can, we, we are of it and in it. So we relate to, to it and we can interact with it, I think in um, intelligent ways and in intelligible ways. 
However, I do think that looking at the question politically and at you know the act at the level of the institutional, that there are better and worse institutions, and, and to disown the um, to disown our desires or our preferences or our uh, commitments for some institutional forms over others, uh, and to be satisfied with the merely symbolic kind of display, uh, just showing up and you know, making a point or protesting or demanding, uh, that would seem to be insufficient to the to the you know, to the depth of what one might really want. And I, mean, I think articulating what that is, uh, especially at a collective level, uh, is difficult. I mean, that was one of the things I think perhaps legitimately that could be a critique of, of Occupy, although I think there are other perspectives on this as well, but that, uh, all, that it, it had difficulty articulating that, you know, that, that, that what it wanted. For, for it had a lot of things that it wanted, but did it come into a coherence that could um, become more than symbolic, become more than making a point, become more than a narrative change, but an institutional change? Because it seems like the underlying dynamics at the institutional level, as far as how the money system works and as far as who's in power and how that power is being used haven't actually changed. And if that's the goal, if the desire is to change those conditions, then something else must be done. And I'm, I, I question whether the pre-institutional or pre-personal or pre-individual forms are sufficient for that. I think that to you know, in, integrally looking at it, we would have to include the pre and the conventional or the, uh, the you know, the, the personal, the individual forms, and also the, the trans individual and the, the trans institutional forms. They would all have to be part of, of the consideration. And so, okay. well, just bringing those together is, is, I think, a big, big challenge and big question. I was going to do a Johnny on you, Marco, just based on... I guess it was last week's uh, minor just our, our wrap up session, but we were we were going into this pre individual space, and you came out and said, "We we need form. We need the constraint of form." So, kind of brings us into invention, into creativity. So to have that constraint is to have the potential for creativity. You also said, which I wrote down here, the ultimate that can be named is not the ultimate reality. Can you expand upon that, please? <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the other thing there? Take care ultimate of little things. reality. We want to hear more about that. <laughs> but, but Set, sets up structures to deconstruct and reconstruct. Could I add something to that? I think that you did a very Please, good. Please, I'm just. There. I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not just joking around. I am being serious. But, but, but go ahead, John. Ultimate reality, and I think I was talking about attunement to affective attunement to the field. So some of us were talking about attunement to the field, and you were talking about ultimate reality, and. My takeaway from that discussion was that maybe these are two different poetic procedures. And I think that came out of the reading that Jeffrey did of um, Ursula Le Guin's translation. Uh, what, what was it? I just, I have the book right here. Tao Te Ching. Yeah, the Tao Te Ching. Um, so I, I think there's, I think it's so tempting to start to get polarized uh but i think these politics is like different schools of poetry 
And I think that's how we, if we start to treat it that way, I think we would be doing, we would have a different kind of poetics and we'd have a different kind of politics too. So, um, and I think on this, where we're working now, we have a lot more leisure to like go into the, the, the sort of uh, the, the dark and murky and obscure spaces that we don't pay attention to in the, the politics, the way that they're framed conventionally. So we can talk about the trans individual and the pre-individual and personal agency, which is, you know, this is pretty fluid stuff. And this isn't like, I think, going to become part of the vocabulary of, of large groups of people anytime soon. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Uh, but we may not, and we may not be rewarded in our lifetimes, but there may be someone who comes after us who may not even know who we are, but they'll be beneficiaries of the kind of hashing out that we're doing today, just as I compare, you know, what the transcendentalists were doing in New England, the abolitionists who got, got together to uh, abolish slavery. That was their main focus. And it was, it was a great part of our history. And it's not died. I mean, those, the, the transcendental movement is alive and well. And um, it still operates just as Occupy. I don't think it's been a failure at all. The vocabulary of the 1% is, is very much part of what's going on now. And the, the, this, this young woman who won the, the primary, uh, Cortez, Alexandra Cortez, she said the night of the primary, she didn't know how it was going to go. She thought it was going to go well, but she wasn't sure. Uh, and she saw these two black men come up to her, two youths with basketballs, and they say, hey, are you uh, Alexander Cortez? And she said, yeah. And she says, we just voted for you. And she said, how old are you? And one of them was 19 and one, the other one was 20. Um, so this is like, and she knew something, something different had just happened. And when she went into the, to the hall there and found out that she won a landslide, 20% uh, ahead of this guy. So I think those are the, that, that kind of a story sort of resonates with me because I think those are the signs that we, should, that we could be giving our attention to that something wants to happen in the field. And it's usually gonna be those minor gestures, you know, not that this was a minor gesture, this is a major gesture, but I think it came out of a lot of little, like she described her, her campaign, just tiny little connections she made between individuals all over the Bronx, which is a very large area. Um, and, and, then they, and it had an accumulative effect. So um, anyway, thank you, that's great. I'm going to defer uh, talking about ultimate reality because I want to ask Lisa, now that she's been listening for a little while, if she has any ref reflections on this. Um, I, I'm really g glad I popped in because um, these are these are really important topics for you know um, our expansion into. Um, you know, uh, probably 10 billion people on this planet. Um, and I, I really wish I hadn't missed the, the discussion about the, the field because I really, uh, I think that's a fruitful, um, a fruitful discussion to have because I think people are starting to, 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 bear with this metaphor, it's not a great one, but find their organ. Um, you know, to the extent that hu humanity and the earth, you know, and you can extend the boundaries out as, as far as you want, um, are becoming a, you know, a, a being of a different type. Um, to the extent that the cells in my body differentiated into heart cells and lung cells and skin cells and blah, blah, blah. Um, we, we might be doing something similar and, and it's the field that's helping the, the fields and subfields um, that as we attune to them, uh, help us, help us find our organ. Um, And and I, I liked the phrase I forget who mentioned it. Um, the the intelligence of the field. 
Um, you know, our, our body heals because of the intelligence of the field. Yeah, there are a lot of, you know, um, molecular things that happen, but I think it happens at the field level first. And um, to the extent that we can align our consciousness with the field, um, I, I, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to do all the time, but... Um, which, which organ are you, Lisa? If you don't mind me, if that's not too personal. Um, well, I like to figure stuff out. So I, I'm somewhere between a, 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 a... And I don't like to do things. I like other people to take my ideas and run with them. So I, I think I'm kind of like a brain cell. <laughs> I like to think stuff up and then pass the baton to people who like to, to do stuff. <laughs> That's funny. I, I remember Rudolf Steiner said, and I don't quite understand this, but he said the most uh, spiritual parts of the body are the, are the hands and the feet. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why he said that, but I sort of do know why he said that, because, you know, and the feet. <laughs> well, in, in paradoxical fashion, the feet are, you know, the feet keep you grounded. The feet keep your energy with the earth, right. which you need. Otherwise, if you just sort of float off into spiritual woo-woo land, you know. And these opposable thumbs, you know, where would our brains be if we didn't have these hands? To manipulate yeah. the way they do. Thank you, Lisa. I love that. I have to think more about that one. I like the heart too. I like the kind of pushing blood out. I like the, the central sort of point between the head and the gut. It kind of um, maybe mediates the energies that flow. Uh, uh, involutionary, evolutionary. Uh, I think that's what I resonate with. Well, like the heart that. has the, the biggest magnetic field in the body. So there, there really is that involution, evolutionary structure actually to the heart, not just in its physical structure, but in its um, uh, electromagnetic structure as well. I think I'm sort of interested in language. Uh, so I guess that's part mind, but it's also part voice. Um, but something you said, uh, we were talking about the similarity, difference, and sameness. Uh, and I think there was some confusion around the differences there. But you, you mentioned at a higher level, they all can be reflected upon. and I think I think that I, that's what I enjoy is that space in between, um, and and I think that's why I say I, I still keep coming back to language as such a as such a, a potent force. Um, if we can, you know, find if we can find um, the connection here between the head and the and the rest of the organism, so that there's enough um, stability so that multiple voices can come through. Mm -hmm. so. Lisa, we've been reading Sri Aurobindo uh, over the past uh, couple of months. Uh, we've been reading The Life Divine, and we're moving on to book two uh, in there. And, and one of the things that, one of, that I'm beginning to understand about how he sees the reality how he sees ultimate reality uh is that it it that is that it does have certain primordial qualities or I mean, he doesn't use this term but we could think of them also i think as organs uh in his model the triune ultimate reality is composed of uh consciousness uh, delight or bliss and and being 
and and then those kind of involved through this evolutionary movement into different kinds of different aspects that we might perceive and that different even schools of philosophy may take to be ultimate in themselves but he argues are are really part of the same thing uh at that at that um higher level uh and so i i think about that in terms of like the maybe what you're saying in term in terms of the human emergence or whatever human human beings are turning into that some we are i think on a planetary context but because we have these flesh organisms we're also extremely local and somehow we have to find the the meta context or the mind that can include them both uh so that there isn't such a there isn't this feeling of total disjuncture between my local self and my uh global or planetary or cosmic uh self yeah that's that's exactly what ellen watts talked about in his little book called the book on the taboo against knowing who you really are hmm. um it's, it's it's a fun little book if if you um haven't read it uh because that's sort of the he he says that that's the basic myth that we're taught is that we're these individual bags of flesh and and um it it sounds like I'm sure he's he read Aurobindo, but I'm, it sounds like he's really aligned with with that. And that's yeah, I, I I would love to um to develop a language to help us remember that, like ongoingly, moment by moment. Um, because our, our language ongoingly keeps us in the assumption that we're separate, and I don't know I don't know how to I don't know how to change that. Um, I mean, not just in the language, but in the culture as well. Say the title of the book again. I just really like that title, and I feel like I want to say something about that. Oh, sure. It's called The Book, and then the subtitle is On the Taboo Against Knowing Who You Really Are. Yeah, and when we were talking, or a few of you said, I'm this cell or that cell, and with what I've been working towards is, I, I don't even know if I want to go into it, but I'm not my body. I'm not, I, I've come to that realization. I've always felt that in some sense. And I feel like the title speaks to that, but I felt like I, I'm this point, not necessarily of my body, but it can becomes part of my body. It can become part of your body. I'm not getting, I, I'm serious about that, but I can't live like that. I can live like that when I'm in my meditative hibernation is my metaphor that I, I'm using for that can save the world if we are all able to hibernate away from the world, away from politics. And I don't know how to articulate that, but just that's, that's how I see. And it's a taboo even to talk about that in a certain sense, because I, I can't even speak to myself about it just yet, but yeah. So, sounds like a good book. I'll check it out. Ellen Watts is just generally fun to read. <laughs> he, he, he calls himself a cosmic entertainer. Yeah, yeah, and he's not he's he's not far off. I mean, yeah. he's he's really I don't I haven't read anything by him that wasn't fun to read. He, he is a fun read, and he's and he's got a lot of things up because I believe he doesn't take himself as seriously as we take him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's one of the great lessons that Mr. Watts has to impart to us, 
is how seriously we take ourselves. You know, I, I, I've always been of the opinion that we can put this in our Abindian terms and it can be Satchananda or it can be Brahman or whatever, but I can tell you one thing, whatever it is, it's got a sense of humor. <laughs> 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 and it's cosmic in proportion. <laughs> We, we we tend to forget that from time to time. You know, it's a. I've always, when I was teaching here, school here in Germany, we kind of followed a model that was a, an afterthought from Montessori and Pistolazzi. It was you know head, heart, and hand, and and that's that's what makes the whole person. And that's why I have no problem with uh, Steiner's hands and feet are the most spiritual organs because that's what we do. It doesn't matter what we think and what we feel. What we do in the world makes all the difference. And so in the end, it's, you know, your actions speak louder than all your words and your, by your fruits, you shall know, there's been, there's a gazillion metaphors and, and images that have been used to, uh, uh, to present that. And, and like we were talking earlier with the, with, uh, Occupy or whatnot, the child itself, at some point it has to determine, well, what part of me is the most prominent to the moment that I am in my life? You know, when do I come across as the head and when do I come across as the hand the hot and the other two elements if we just take those three for simplicity one hierarchically takes the lead and the other two subordinate themselves and that happens in a dynamic off interchange and 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 and, and, and rotation as the situations that we encounter in life uh, determine that we have to do that so you know there's not like this one way it's 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 a, it's it's kind of complex, but reducing it to head, heart, and hand for me is simple because I only have three thing, three balls I have to juggle, so to speak. You know, <laughs> that's that, that's why I prefer that that approach as opposed to others because it becomes too complicated. You know, I'm I'm a simple person when you get right down to it. So sometimes the one the ones out in front, and sometimes the other. And I always hope the right one is in front at the right time. My life has shown me that's not always been the case, okay? But we're still working on that. And that's why I find um, people like Mr. Watts very, <laughs> very helpful because he always reminds me, eh, nobody gets out of here alive anyhow. You know? <laughs> so right. that was that. Fun to listen to, too. He's got this beautiful voice. And yeah. Yeah. They still oh, play him yeah, on the yeah, radio, yeah. I think, every week in, in New York City. Yeah. yeah. He, he's a nice guy to chill with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Doug, you can find a lot of his stuff on YouTube um, that you can listen to. Yeah, there's also a podcast of his, or somebody put on the podcast. I haven't listened to it in a while, but has... An enormous amount of recordings. So. Just been a while. I'll have to revisit him. So, are we talking about the same Alan Watts who was writing like 30, 40 years ago? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I read maybe 10 of his books back then, but I haven't read any of them for a while. But. No, no, I haven't either. Every once in a while, he pops up on the radar screen and I get a little input and I'm going, okay. He, he's, a, he's, he's changed tremendously and it hasn't changed a bit. No, you can tell he's been just going along with that 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 whole thing, the whole time, and, he, and he's still fun. That that's a thing that I like, and he's still fun. <laughs> but that's the same one. <laughs> so just just quickly, his um, daughter Anne or Anna, um, a bit, two of his daughters recently published a collection of his letters, and. Mm -hmm. um, Anna came through town and, and did a reading at the Henry Miller library. And so I went down and um, heard her and, and she was really forthcoming about like what he was as a person, how, how he was like as a father and, and um, just remarkably honest and able to deal with all of the, um, let's say the, the unsavory parts of his life. But very real. Anyhow, the, the letters are fun reading, too.
by their by their fruits, you shall know them, I guess. Uh, <laughs> all right, so that was uh, the ontology of self governance, perhaps. Uh, oh, I, have you have we articulated any of our assumptions for you, Marco? <laughs> I don't know if I could uh, articulate them in, in a systematic way, um, but I feel like we've traversed various as various parts of the field, uh, and I think that we also um, attuned maybe uh, just by listening to each other, uh, and uh, I think also it was interesting to reflect on occupy uh and just for myself to remember that that was that was part of the context that history was part of the context for wanting to do something wanting to act in some way take action uh and uh and i think it still presents this a problem um you know which is that uh It's, I'm going to say, I'm saying it's a problem, but I, I, the problem, though, is that the, the reality still has to be dealt with. Uh, and um, the conditions that Occupy was responding to or that, Jeffrey, you were responding to in your activism um, and even Watts was you know, speaking about in the 60s, right? I mean, he became a figure, uh, a popular figure in the midst of a huge cultural upheaval uh, where really we're dealing with a lot of the same issues that are perhaps more complex because of the accumulated history and the technology and the global interconnections. But I think the maybe core dramas are still the, the same uh, or similar. Um, I... I uh, I remain interested in the um, the technological layer because I think the way that some of these technologists are thinking, those particularly who are bringing some philosophical view to to it or some historical grounding in terms of how technology impacts society and how 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 it constitutes the ways that we experience ourselves as consciousness. Um, that there could be different ways that things are organized. They don't have to be the one percent. Uh, I mean, just to put it really simply, you know, extracting uh, the you know huge surpluses of of, of, of our, co our collective resources. I think there have to be better ways of of organizing ourselves at every scale. Uh, and so I'm glad that we're talking about it because. Um, it gives me a way to, I think, gauge really what this is all about. Uh, I'm in a learning process, just like I think we 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 all are, uh, and and I want that learning to lead to some some actual change. I I would like it, may, and there may not be a, a linear way to to make that happen, but ultimately. I would like for this not to just be entertainment. I would like for it to be part of, uh, because entertainment suggests kind of a, an illusion that you consume for, you know, your pleasure. But like what Aurobindo is saying is that the ultimate is real. The ultimate is generative of reality and of realities. And so I think that to participate in that generative process is part of what, um, what is the opportunity and so thank you for uh, indulging in this uh, conversation and um, look forward to some of the other topics that we've been uh, tossing about. Jeffrey, and I, you've, you've had a couple of uh, things you wanted to bring in and uh, John and Doug and also... Uh, Doug and I are going to work on something tomorrow, but Jeffrey has been working also with Heather on quantum... Um, quantum poetics and working with the field and Lisa you're interested in the field so maybe we can all do something in the future this is just a put that out on the table as a possibility of how can we 
um, you know, find techniques to work with the field more effectively. Not that we're not working with it effectively already, but we could maybe do it even better. That's a possibility for future cafes, I think. Yeah, well, we're going to do a cafe early in August on uh, quantum poetics, so you might want to um, <laughs> watch on it, Lisa, or we'll let you know when we do it. So. Oh, I'll mention uh, Amanda Moreno, who um, has been uh, following these conversations. She's checked in on the forum. I think it was the Integrating Science and Art talk. Uh, she has offered to do um, a piece on Cosmos and Psyche, introducing Richard Tarnas's. Great. I love him. That'd be great. I think that'll be on the, that'll be on the 14th, right, Doug? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. that's what the... So we do have a calendar. It's a Google calendar. The link is somewhere on the forum. Should probably reshare it. But I've been adding these events there so that we could keep track and semi-govern. That's what we love to hear, Marco. It's somewhere <laughs> on the forum. <laughs> I'm glad you nailed that down. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maybe it's just project management that we yeah, maybe, well, maybe, but it's that's no, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thank you, you very all. much. Good to see y'all. Yeah, it was right. good to see you. It was fun. Next time. Bye.